Well, welcome again to another podcast, Down to Earth, but Heavenly Minded. I'm your host, Irv Risch. And as we move forward, we're going to be going through the entire New Testament. Uh, and with that, we're going to do a commentary afterwards. And uh, with that said, let us just move on to our next section. And thank you for joining me. Chapter 4 This is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness, and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us you have become kings. And would that you did reign, so that we might share the rule with you. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless, and we labor working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become, and are still, like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ, as I teach them everywhere in every church. Some are arrogant, as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills. And I will find out not the talk of those arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod, or with love in a spirit of gentleness? First Corinthians chapter 4 For verse 1, in order that they might properly appraise Paul and the other apostles, he says that the saints should look upon them as servants or assistants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. A steward is a servant who cares for the person or property of another. The mysteries of God were the previously hidden secrets which God revealed to the apostles and prophets of the NT period. For verse 2, a major requirement in stewards is to be found faithful. Man values cleverness, wisdom, wealth, and success, but God is looking for those who will be faithful to Jesus in all things. For verse 3, the faithfulness that is required in stewards is a difficult thing for people to evaluate. That is why Paul says here that with him it is a very small thing that he should be judged by the Corinthians or by a human court. Paul realizes how utterly unable man is to form a competent judgment of true faithfulness to God. 
He adds, in fact, I do not even judge myself. He realized that he was born into the human family with a judgment that was constantly biased in his own favor. For verse 4, when the apostle says I know of nothing against myself, he means that in the matter of Christian service, he is not conscious of any charge of unfaithfulness that might be brought against him. He does not mean for a moment that he does not know of any sin in his life or any way in which he falls short of perfection. The passage should be read in the light of the context, and the subject here is Christian service and faithfulness in it. But even if he did not know anything against himself, yet he was not justified by this. He simply was not competent to judge in the matter. After all, the Lord is the judge. For verse 5, in view of this, we should be extremely careful in our appraisal of Christian service. We tend to exalt the spectacular and sensational, and depreciate that which is menial or inconspicuous. The safe policy is to judge nothing before the time, but to wait until the Lord comes. He will be able to judge, not only what is seen by the eye, but also the motives of the hearts, not only what was done, but why it was done. He will reveal the counsels of the hearts, and, needless to say, anything that was done for self-display or self-glory will fail to receive a reward. That each one's praise will come from God is not to be taken as a flat promise that every believer's service will show up in a favorable way in that day. The meaning is that everyone who deserves praise will receive praise from God and not from men. In the next eight verses, the Apostle states quite clearly that pride is the cause of the divisions that have come into the church at Corinth. For verse 6, he first explains that in speaking about the Christian ministry and the tendency to follow human leaders, 3 verse 5 to 4 verse 5, he used himself and Apollos as the examples. The Corinthians were not forming parties around Paul and Apollos alone, but also around other men who were then in their church. However, out of a sense of Christian courtesy and delicacy, Paul transferred the entire matter to himself and Apollos so that by their example the saints would learn not to have exaggerated opinions of their leaders or to gratify their pride by the formation of parties. He wanted the saints to evaluate everything and everyone by the scriptures. For verse 7, if one Christian teacher is more gifted than another, it is because God made him so. Everything he has, he received from the Lord. In fact it is true of all of us that everything we have has been given to us by God. That being the case, why should we be proud or puffed up? Our talents and gifts are not the result of our own cleverness. For verse 8, the Corinthians had become self-sufficient, they were already full. They prided themselves on the abundance of spiritual gifts in their midst, they were already rich. They were living in luxury, comfort, and ease. There was no sense of need. They acted as if they were already reigning, but they were doing so without the apostles. Paul states that he could wish that the time to reign had already come so that he might reign with them. But in the meantime, lifetime is training time for reigning time, as someone has said. Christians will reign with the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes back and sets up his kingdom on earth. In the meantime, their privilege is to share the reproach of a rejected Savior. H. P. Barker warns. It is positive disloyalty to seek our crown before the king gets his. Yet this is what some of the Christians at Corinth were doing. The apostles themselves were bearing the reproach of Christ. But the Corinthian Christians were rich and honorable. They were seeking a good time where their Lord and Master had such a hard time. At coronations, peers and peeresses never put on their coronets until the sovereign has been crowned. The Corinthians were reversing this, they were already reigning while the Lord was still in rejection. For verse 9, in contrast to the self-satisfaction of the Corinthians, Paul describes the lot of the apostles. He pictures them as thrown into the arena with wild beasts while men and angels look on. As Godet has said, it was not time for the Corinthians to be self-complacent and boasting, while the church was on the throne and the apostles were under the sword. For verse 10, while the apostles were treated as fools for Christ's sake, the saints enjoyed prestige in the community as wise Christians. The apostles were weak, but the Corinthians suffered no infirmity. In contrast to the dishonor of the apostles was the eminence of the saints. For verse 11, it did not seem to the apostles that the hour of triumph or of reigning had come. They were suffering from hunger and thirst and nakedness and persecution. They were hunted, pursued, and homeless. 
For verse 12, they supported themselves by working with their own hands. For reviling, they returned blessing. When they were persecuted, they did not fight back, but patiently endured. For verse 13, when defamed, they entreated men to accept the Lord Jesus. In short, they were made as the filth of the world, the scum of all things. This description of suffering for the sake of Christ should speak to all our hearts. If the Apostle Paul were living today, could he say to us, as he said to the Corinthians, You have reigned as kings without us? For verse 14, in verses 14 to 21, Paul gives a final admonition to the believers on the subject of divisions. Conscious of the fact that he has been using irony, he explains that he has not done so to shame the Christians, but rather to warn them as his beloved children. He was not inspired by bitterness to speak as he had done, but rather by a sincere interest in their spiritual welfare. For verse 15, the apostle reminds them that though they might have ten thousand instructors in Christ, yet they have only one father in the faith. Paul himself had led them to the Lord, he was their spiritual father. Many others might come along to teach them, but no others could have the same tender regard for them as the one who pointed them to the Lamb. Paul does not at all intend to depreciate the ministry of teaching, but is simply stating what we all know to be true, namely, that many can be engaged in Christian service without the personal interest in the saints that is characteristic of one who has pointed them to Christ. For verse 16, Paul therefore urges them to be imitators of himself, that is, in his unselfish devotion to Christ and in his tireless love and service for his fellow believers, such as he has described in verses 9 to 13. For verse 17, in order to help them reach this goal, Paul sent Timothy to them, his beloved and faithful son in the Lord. Timothy was instructed to remind them of Paul's ways in Christ, ways which he taught in all the churches. Paul is saying that he practiced what he preached, and this should be true of everyone who engages in Christian service. For verse 18, when Paul explained that he was sending Timothy to them, perhaps some of his detractors in Corinth would rise quickly to suggest that Paul was afraid to come himself. These men were puffed up in suggesting that Paul was not coming personally. For verse 19, but he promises that he will come in the near future, if the Lord wills. When he does, he will expose the pride of those who can talk so freely, but have no spiritual power. For verse 20, after all, it is power that counts, for the kingdom of God is not concerned principally with words but with action. It does not consist of profession, but of reality. For verse 21, the manner in which Paul comes to them will depend on themselves. If they show a rebellious spirit, he will come to them with a rod. If, on the other hand, they are humble and submissive, he will come in love and a spirit of gentleness. Well, this ends another one of our podcasts, and uh, until next time, just remember, God is out here, and you can find out all about him in your Bibles. All you have to do is pick it up and read it. I have mine right here, and uh, God is in this Bible, so please read it. With that said, bye for now. Till next time.